Hey guys, Ben Nash from Pivot Wealth here. And uh, today I'm pumped to be back with Joni Pirovich, good friend of the show. She's a principal at uh, Blockchain and Digital Asset Services and, and Law. Um, Bedazzle for short, for anyone that's wondering what that's about uh, on the screen. Joni, thanks for joining us. <laughs> thanks for having me, Ben. No, it's great to have you back. And uh, for anyone that that hasn't already caught the the last conversation I had with Joni, um, the background is that that Joni's business it comes from a legal background, but her business is right on the bleeding edge, basically of um, crypto, digital assets, the regulation that sits around that, uh, and she works with a, with a bunch of the the uh, tradfi or traditional financial services companies, um, also working with the regulators on the. Um, you know the evolving landscape, and talking about how quickly things are changing in the in the in the uh, digital asset space is, um, yeah, it's uh, it's a struggle to keep up with for anyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm keen to pick your brain about some of the developments that we're seeing and, and what people should be thinking about. But I thought a, a, an interesting place to start would be to to just maybe talk about your journey as a as a digital asset investor um how that's progressed we're just having a little bit of a chat offline um about some of the learnings on that journey i was sharing my story about my fear around sending thirty thousand dollars into the internet to buy crypto punk which i now <laughs> wish i could have pushed through that fear to make happen but um yeah could you could you maybe talk us through your your journey and some of the learnings on the way sure i um there's probably a lot of war stories but but I'll pick one. <laughs> it, it's similar to you with that uh, comfort level around ten, twenty thousand, you know, thirty thousand dollars worth of of real cash, turning that into you know Bitcoin or Ether. Um, for me now, it's typically Ether um, that I I'll buy on a centralized exchange and I'll send it to my MetaMask wallet. And, and that allows me to connect to all of these decentralized applications, sometimes to do um, DeFi, decentralized finance things, but often, you know, and particularly over the last year to invest in NFT projects. And a year ago, you know, was about the time when the Bored Apes were launched and, and friends of mine, they just wanted to get into the project because it allowed them, you needed to have that NFT to access the Discord and be able to, to write on a bathroom wall. Like it was just, um, it, that, that was like the, the driver and the draw and the marketing or, or one of the drivers that mm. connected with a, a lot of uh, what we call crypto degens <laughs> and, or, or people that just love hanging out, um, seeing what the alpha is, the newest things to do, you know, NFT projects are really teaching us and experimenting uh, what the limits are and, and what utility we can realise, how we can coordinate capital and communities around writing on a bathroom wall or investing in something or, mm. you know, buying a constitution in the US, which which is one of the examples as well. So um, it, that was, you know, very early stage. And then as we've all seen, the board Ape um, collection just increase massively in value same with the crypto punks and and i see all of these things happen early and i didn't necessarily connect with wanting to write on a bathroom wall for example <laughs> yeah. and but but you know that. often I can't imagine that, so. <laughs> well but often um it's it's the early random use case which helps prove a concept and then there's mm. a lot of things that follow on and then what we're finding in Web3 is that the earliest project to, to start that train or, or to trigger a journey or, or a movement, that becomes very highly valued, if for nothing else than for sentimental reasons of being that first thing. Mm. So, I mean, and, and other people will probably give you many different explanations of, of why a board ape has value and why it increases and decreases at any one time. Mm. But, you know, and I, I so I, I have OpenSea on my desktop. That's one of the biggest NFT marketplaces. And, and I also saw the World of Women collection um, get post or get listed. And, mm. and I thought, oh, you know, this, this looks, it really aligns to my values even. Um, 
I'm very big on gender and diversity in Web3 and doing what we can to promote that stuff. And still, you know, for 500 or so dollars, um, which is which was the lowest price that you could buy a world of women in NFT at the time, I still didn't feel comfortable or familiar to put that much ETH into an NFT mm. project because my comfort levels and the majority of what I had advised on was around fungible tokens and governance tokens. And I understand, I understood the legals, the financials, a bit more about the economic valuation models just to justify even a $500 investment. But I wasn't comfortable on the NFT side. But fast forward, you know, six months and a year from from that experience with Bored Apes and with um, World of Women, recently there was a Moonbirds raffle. It's another NFT project. And you basically had to have 2.5 ETH, which is around 12,000 Aussie dollars worth in your wallet um, to meet the preconditions to sort of participate in the raffle. Mm. And, um, and, and so to go from discomfort at a $500 investment and, and now a comfort level to put, you know, 10 to $12,000 worth of ETH in a wallet to participate in a raffle, which I didn't actually, I, I, I didn't succeed in that raffle. And now the Moonbirds collection is, is the, fastest, highest growth NFT project and in terms of trade volume uh, of all time, uh, people are now selling those things for millions of dollars. Mm. Uh, it, it just goes to show um, I'm still on a learning journey as, as yeah. are a number of us, but, but I suppose getting in early and experimenting with things, following the projects, that's you know, apart from financial advisors that might report, might write reports to educate you about these things, learning and being in the environment also helps your comfort levels, your ability, ability to analyze and assess opportunity and risk, and then make informed decisions with what capital you have available at the time. So disclaimer, this is not financial or legal or tax advice. It's just my own personal journey. Totally. Uh, and yeah, look, I, I don't know, like uh, I'd see with NFTs, like I, as I say, I wanted to buy one a while back. Obviously, they're going ballistic at the moment, but part of me and part a big part of me thinks that they'll continue to, to grow. But then part of me just thinks, Jesus, this is absolutely ridiculous. Like you say that like people want to just write on a bathroom wall and they, they pay $500 for these things that are now worth like a million dollars um do you th obviously it's it's really sparked something in people and the market and we're seeing this movement as a result but what do you think the long term holds for uh, for these sorts of things which are really just like you know internet pictures which you can take a screenshot of the internet for free um mm -hmm. what's your take yeah. on that well i think that a lot of the nfts started as just an image and a collection and and profile pictures or pfps where it was social credibility to have an ape that you could use on your twitter profile um mm. or you know now that we're learning more about the ip and the commercial rights there's a restaurant opening in the us i think that's that's called some derivative of a bored ape cafe and they can do that because they own that particular bored ape and that attracts its own crowd to the restaurant um, mm. So it becomes it becomes access or almost a competitive differentiator, where you can use your ownership of that NFT to market and to access different um, customer segments and or you know new sources of revenue that a restaurant may not have had access to before they owned that particular NFT, and and mm. that is what we're seeing. This the journey might start with a JPEG, um, or or a video file. Uh, but but it, it it's then an exploration of what utility and access can be added. And this Moonbirds project in particular has a very solid and very capable team that are well connected internationally to celebrities, politicians. And so it's you're not just buying a Moonbird for the social cred or the PFP ability. Mm. You're actually also securing a ticket to access discounts to restaurants um i think for one that has a moon or a, or a space helmet you might get a trip to outer space thanks to e elon musk is is one of the rumors that i'm hearing but 
it's the it's now uh, an exploration on what utility can be delivered because you hold that token. So you don't think that people just turn around in a few years and go, Jesus, this is ridiculous. Let's uh, do I really want to pay a million dollars for that for this this JPEG or? Oh, I think there'll be ebbs and flows, and and yeah. we'll have bear and bull markets, and and we don't know how that's going to pan out, and we also don't know the impact of more of the mainstream coming in and having exposure passive you know passively holding fungible tokens or non-fungible tokens or both um mm. and and at what stage they might start being more involved in what web3 and what blockchain can do so if they hold an nft or if they know that they're going to travel to the us and having a particular nft means that they get discounts at all the places that they're going to go mm. to um these are the sort of new spins on marketing and and you know customer loyalty network loyalty that are that are all capable by proving that you have the token in your wallet at any one yeah. particular time so how people value that i don't know how they resell yeah. it how they justify holding on to it um these are all economic models to be explored well, yeah, it's it's turning the traditional economic models on their head. That is uh, that is for sure. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing a lot and hearing a lot at the moment is this the the Bitcoin and Ether, um, and it seems that that Ether is particularly increasing a lot more in popularity. I'm sure you understand the ins and outs much better than I do. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, I, my my limited understanding is that there's probably more use cases for for the ether protocol um what what is driving that though and do you have any further insight you can share around um the race around bitcoin and ether yeah it's it's almost there's another element to this race too because bitcoin was the first blockchain and then a few years later ethereum followed and and then a few years even after Ethereum, we had a proliferation of Ethereum killers that, you know, Ethereum thought it could do blockchain and crypto assets better than Bitcoin. And all of these Ethereum killers think that they can do the new internet and crypto assets better than Ethereum. So mm. if, you, if you're just comparing Bitcoin and Ether um, as crypto assets, that's, I think, a top level analysis and Bitcoin on its own network can only function as a peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash. And people might choose to hold it as an investment and speculate on, on whether it will go up and down. But in terms of its utility and its use on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's, it's just an exercise of, of transferring the value from peer-to-peer. -peer. But on Ethereum, that's a virtual machine and it gave us smart contract capability so we can start automating business functions and this is what's given us an ability to effectively build the new internet or many many new internets so when i'm looking at ethereum blockchain as a value proposition its technology allows more companies or projects to build on ethereum you can do more on the blockchain and you need to hold ether to pay what we call for gas for all of those automations to trigger and to function so if this then that and in order to have that if this then that function process you have to have an, an ether balance in your wallet to pay the fee the gas fee in order to to, to for that to process so there are many businesses around the world that have built these autonomous applications on Ethereum. And that's why we have a number of, of what we call governance tokens um, and other project tokens that are compliant with the Ethereum blockchain. But you also need that underlying Ether to make it operate. But it's built mm. a network. And, and because a lot of the network is being built around Ethereum, that's why Ether might become more valuable than a Bitcoin because the network and all the transactions are happening on the Ethereum. Like that's the trustworthy blockchain in which all of the transactions in the world, not necessarily just the financial tra transactions are being settled. I see. So, but for sentimental reasons and maybe for other reasons, Bitcoin might be that first thing that is digital gold. And yeah. 
and and it, it might be the most decentralized in terms of number of Bitcoin miners that are securing the network. So for the most trustworthy transactions, you might want to transact on the Bitcoin blockchain rather than the Ethereum, because the more businesses that are using the Ethereum blockchain, the more pressure it comes under, the more transactions it has to process, and it's mm. got a limited transaction processing speed. So to scale, it's now having to change its technology and, and develop what we call layer twos, which is not necessarily the same amount of trust and security as having your transaction settled on the main Ethereum blockchain. And so, mm. so there's, it, get, it can get very nitty gritty um, and into no, the technical yeah. detail. But, but these are the things playing out um, and part of the analysis of, of will the Bitcoin price go above this level? Will the Ether price surpass? Bitcoin, um, there are a number of factors involved. I know a number of them and I, I still couldn't predict <laughs> where they're going to pan out. Yeah, no, I don't think we, we obviously don't have a crystal ball, but it's also for me, I think that there's an element of that sentimentality, especially with Bitcoin as the first um, uh, crypto asset that it's hard to imagine a future where 10 years, 50 years from now that there isn't a strong demand for that, for almost for that reason alone, not to mention, as you say, that it's a massive network Joni, what would you what would your your advice be or your tips be for people that you know have been following along at some level with the crypto sort of movement that they feel like they want to invest and and start to get involved um but they're they're fearful and and still on that journey of, of building their knowledge what what do you think is the best way for people to tackle things well, I've, I've always said it's, it's not necessarily about an asset class. It's about what the technology can do and improving your digital skills. So yes, there is a financial cost involved to turn your Australian dollars into Bitcoin or Ether or some other crypto asset on a centralized exchange. But going through the process of transferring it to a wallet like a MetaMask wallet and, and connecting and just playing that is what is actually going to start showing you and piquing your curiosity about what the technology does. And, and so when you see a token listed on a centralized exchange that you can acquire for your Australian dollars, you'll be more informed to be able to understand what you're buying or what you're investing in. And, you know, look at the website, look at the white paper and, and actually understand this is something that probably could provide utility to the world or is a new way of doing things mm. or, or is really risky. And, but I'm willing to take that risk if it's 0.1 of a percent of my portfolio, but not 50% or more of my wealth. And, and I think that coming at it from that approach rather than, you know, these are the top 10 traded at any one time, mm. um, you Sounds know, it, it, you will become more informed and you'll be improving your digital skills at the same time. And I, I think that that is the framework in which pe more people should come to crypto assets. But I am realistic and I understand that um, it is very tempting to sort of just look at a dashboard and, and look at some statistics. But I would caution people away from investing on that FOMO or, or without really understanding what they're buying. Absolutely. And I think that following like trends are interesting and insightful, but when you're, whether it's digital assets or traditional shares or property or anything else, I think if people are just looking at what other people are doing um, and looking to follow suit, it's like you're, you're heading for that herd mentality. Can give you some insights as to point your, you know, research and focus on, but um, as the only decision maker, I think not, although, um, yeah, it, it comes down to the research. And I think, you, you know, you were just chatting before we fired up um, the, the camera about like doing some stuff. I think that's one of the beauties of cryptocurrency and digital assets is that you can do really small things, learn some stuff because it is all fractional. And then you're building your knowledge, building your confidence um, as you and you yeah, learning a, a, along the way. Mm, Joni, exactly. what? What trends, I, I know that you, you, like I said at the start, right on the bleeding edge of, you know, what traditional finance and, and regulators are doing in this space. What, what trends are you seeing at the moment? Well, I think a big one that will affect the mainstream 
and and might be that first experience that the ordinary person um, will have with crypto assets is stable coins. And so this this is an umbrella term, but mostly what we call fiat currency pegged or, or an Australian dollar pegged stable coin. So you have uh, a one to one ratio where you might have a bank account with $100 at ANZ. ANZ have just um, announced that, that they're working on a stable coin project. And you can choose to mint a stable coin that mirrors your cash balance. So for $100 in my bank account, I might choose to turn that into $100 of AUD stable coins. Mm. Now, this is a new choice. No bank has, has given us this choice before. Like I said, I have to take my cash onto a centralized cryptocurrency exchange to convert it into typically Bitcoin or Ether, the volatile crypto assets. And so for me to make that choice with a bank that maybe I trust, maybe I don't, um, you know, that, that, that's the first part of the journey. Like, what does it mean? Why would I mint that stable coin? And, and so the next step is what, I think will be really interesting whether customers of the bank choose to take that stable coin, transfer it to their own digital wallets and perhaps stake it in a DeFi, a decentralized finance protocol to earn more return or yield than what they could have done if they did just have cash in the bank account earning, you know, less than 1% interest. Mm. And some of the yields, some of the yields that we are seeing in DeFi are upwards of 5%, you know, and sometimes upwards of 10%, there are risks involved, you know, and the potential loss of all of your stable coins if that staking protocol is not secure or, or if something else happens um, where you, you suffer a loss of that underlying stable coin value. But in order for banks to retain those deposits, whether that, you know, be cash or stable coins, they're going to have to start facilitating access and educating their customers on what they can do with their stable coins and, and maybe what the bank can help them do, obviously, for a fee. And, and if people feel comfortable to do it themselves or want to take the risk of doing it themselves, then perhaps they don't pay the fee, but they then wear the risk of the loss of the whole stable coin. So all of these things, I think, will start um, you know, ANZ has already announced their stable coin, but, but in terms of access by the mainstream to that stable coin product, I think maybe the back end of this year or early next year. And, and I suspect that the other banks will fast follow. I don't know, but, um, this is a real, a, a really critical trend and it, it might only feel small, but it, it's facilitating access to digital assets, to crypto assets mm. and what all of that innovation and utility is being built um, in, in Web3. So that's one that I'm very interested in watching and, and for other reasons too, because our monetary policy and how we manage the stability of our Australian coast, um, current Australian dollar relies on our regulators like APRA and the RBA getting data on our consumer spending and mm. how many people have loans with the bank and, and if more people start using DeFi to get a home loan, to get a business loan, um, start purchasing everyday things with crypto, because uh, that that is being made possible more and more so too, how do we get that data back to the regulators to keep the Australian dollar a stable currency? Mm. Um, so, so I think all of that will play out over these next few years, but access to the mainstream um, with stable coins is is definitely a big one. And it seems like the, the banks must be intending to provide access to some of those DeFi type projects or staking or whatever it is with the stable coins, because otherwise, like, why would they do that? Like, what benefit is a stable coin to ANZ when someone transfers it across if they're not doing anything? And it's like, why would someone do it if they're not doing anything with it, right? Mm. Yeah, and, and so, again, a new economic model and a new opportunity for banks to explore. Mm. And they're big organisations already. Some of the fintechs and the Web3 startups are, are, are doing and offering what we call CFI, DeFi bridges. 
centralized finance to decentralized finance where they do walk a customer through depositing or contributing their Australian dollars and choosing sort of the risk level or the yield level that they want their crypto assets to be deployed into. So mm. that that's already happening, that that innovation is already happening, um, but obviously not with the customer bases that our big banks have. So yes. I'm sure that they're learning and watching and, and I'm very interested to see what they're doing too. Oh, yeah, it's super interesting, super confusing, but also super, uh, super interesting <laughs> as well. Well, um, I think it's impor an important trend for financial advisors because no longer is holding cash in a bank account a sort of dormant or, or risk-averse strategy. You know, holding a stable coin with a bank and ticking yes to a yield strategy managed by the bank, that that's, could perhaps be another tool in the tool belt for, mm. for financial advisors. Yeah, well, it's in interesting. I was looking on the Finder website the other day and I see that they've got a uh, staking project there where they've got their Finder cash and you can earn 4%. Again, it's not without risk. It's not like just putting your money in a, in a bank account. But, um, mm. yeah, you see that these things are coming up and that that obviously the, the yield of 4% does have a appeal for, for investors that their other option is, you know, we've got clients with significant cash and they're chasing half a percent um, somewhere and jumping through a bunch of hoops to get there. So, um, yeah, it's, mm. it, it is interesting. And I think for, for advisors and our clients, it's um, you know, my next question is going to be about the regulation and, and what happens there. But it is, it is hard to see inside of these things. But also it seems that we are sort of getting a bit closer with getting a bit more regulation, which I think is a good thing to give more clarity to investors, to advisors like us, to um, support people in this, what is a space that's growing rapidly and increasing in importance, I think, for, uh, for the future. So on that, what are you seeing from a, from a regulation? I don't know that you could probably break my brain with uh, some of the stuff that you're seeing, but what do you think is, is particularly relevant for, for crypto and digital asset investors in a regulation space at the moment? Well, most investors um, and institutions are trying to get the answer of, of what makes something institutional or investment grade. The, the mm. industry and, and a number of crypto asset projects are still so early, still so volatile, no proven economic models. And I don't think that any proposed regulation around the world gives us the certainty that we need to make this, this asset class um, investment grade in the same way that a share in a company is. They're just so new and emerging and evolving and finding themselves that they don't fit into the existing regimes or, or how we see and value things. So I don't think that regulation will be the silver bullet that gives us certainty, but it might help remove some of the regulatory risk that the projects are bearing. And if you think that um, it's too risky to invest in the ones that really look like financial products, but you haven't seen any sort of disclosure documentation. They don't have a financial services license. Um, if, if you would have previously stayed away from that because you're pricing in regulatory risk, regulatory risk that the token might be a hundred dollars, but you value it at zero because they haven't been compliant. Um, then that sort of clarification in, in regulatory policy would be, I think give more confidence to the market to invest in these sorts of things. Mm. Um, but, I, but I don't know that it'll necessarily pan out that way. On one end of the spectrum, we've got um, calls for crypto assets to be regulated under a completely new and separate regime. We may have non-binding reference back to existing corporate and tax laws. Um, but, but it, that, that's the extent of it, non-binding. You know, you can only use it for reference to inform how you might interpret this new law, but you've got a very free reign, um, you know, minimum floor type standards that encourages innovation. Mm. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you've got um, advocates calling for all crypto assets to be financial products and regulated as such unless they fit within certain safe harbor exemptions. So maybe 
when the token launches, it doesn't need to have a financial services license, even if it's a managed investment scheme, because it's it's still in its early days and its market capitalization might be under a million dollars or under $5 million. So mm. it doesn't justify having the onerous burden um, of, of compliance with a regulatory regime that maybe should kick in when it's got a market capitalization of $30 million or, you know, more than a thousand users and and those sort of exemptions are what we're trying to clarify as part of the policy process to test the limits of each end of the spectrum and i imagine that we'll end somewhere in the middle in terms of how consumers are best protected and and also how we protect financial stability and our ability Mm. to control monetary policy so there's there's those macro factors at play because some of the DAOs that I've advised, within 12 months, they're worth multiple billions of dollars because they're global from the get-go, which is mm. faster growth than any sort of traditional startup that issues shares in a company. And it's, you know, they, they have to get to around $50 million worth of evaluation before they can list on, you know, the national Australian stock exchange. So, hmm. so the growth that, that these global things go through is immense. And if you have enough of them, um, you know, we've got an existing economy uh, of $350 trillion. That's our financial services economy. And, and we don't know what fraction or, or you know, we've got 10, 10 projects that are worth billions of dollars that could be globally systemic and trigger um, bigger consequences that we're not prepared for. And, and so this is a new policy issue for us too, mm. these naturally global protocols and things, but we, we typically regulate to our sovereign nation. So there'll be a, there'll be a, um, an exercise of, of trying to get to international consensus as well. And there'll be a bit of com- competition between countries to have better policies. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that's, I, I can't tell you how it will land, but I think that we'll have to get comfortable with uncertainty for a good while longer. Mm. When do you think, are there any sort of milestones or timelines around when investors might, you know, work through some of the, the approach to regulation? You mentioned partly dependent on the election. Is there something expected after that? Well, the existing Treasury consultation is focused on CASPERS, the CASPER regime, which is crypto asset secondary service providers. So these are the likes of your centralised cryptocurrency exchanges, companies offering crypto asset custody um, where there's a human team and often with a company in registered in the background that's the proposed regulation and and the submissions are due at the end of may but we could have a different government by then so what treasury receives in terms of all of those submissions if we have a Labor government, then we, we don't understand their crypto policy yet. I'm not sure that they will prioritise it over some of their other mm. um, election commitments. So there, it, it could be completely de-resourced. Um, the direction could change. And, and so because we've got this potential change of government hanging over our heads, yes, there is a, a due date for the consultation, but we're not sure... Um, how it will continue if if labor gets in mm, let's hope that that doesn't happen because i'm sure the investors would would prefer and and people <laughs> you know, following the space and more certainty um, well there, there is I, I see there being um treasury has gone for the low-hanging fruit to to regulate these caspers but i see the economic opportunity for australia being in legal recognition of DAOs because all of these crypto assets are coming out of dow projects and that's a decentralized autonomous organization Mm. and that's those are the ones that are global from the get-go and and there are 10,000 plus tokens on the market Um, there's not that many DAOs but that's the economic opportunity that's the innovation and and that's what needs some minimum guardrails because even if a Casper a centralized cryptocurrency exchange is regulated and it's a safe shop front if it lists a very risky token because we've got no minimum yeah. floor standards for how the tokens are coming to life, consumers are still at risk. Mm, absolutely. So I personally feel that 
Treasury and, and the existing government would have liked to tackle the bigger question first, but with an upcoming election, it probably made more sense to start with Casper's. Mm, Excuse me. Certainly. <coughs> Certainly with the complexity, I think, that's around, you know, any of that stuff, it's it's probably uh, sounds like it's more challenging. A few more hours for you to put in, I think, to get it, <laughs> to help get us there. Um, yeah. But, Joni, thank you so much for sharing your insights. For people that are keen to learn more about what what you do, what's the best way for them to, to reach out or get in touch or learn more? Well, I try to put as much as possible in my Discord server. I'll, I'll send the link to you for your listeners to access, but that's where I put my latest thinking, you know, connections that might be useful to financial advisors, tax accountants. I've got a channel in there about Dow policy, another one about tax policy with crypto assets, another one for insurance. So um, pick the channel that suits your interest or curiosity, ask some questions. Uh, I try to contribute as much as I can there and, and sort of live in that world and space. So um, connect, join and contribute there and, and be part of the growing Bedazzle community and Discord server. Please. Awesome. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll throw that up onto the, the show notes and uh, wherever you're listening to this as well. So check it out. Joni, thanks again for sharing your insights. I know you're a very busy bee, so I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, yeah, good, good luck with it and we'll catch you on the next one. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Ben. Cheers.